So welcome to Spirit Guided with me, Jamila Jimunja, where we explore what it means to live a spirit guided life in a modern world. And as a spirit guide medium and author, I teach you how to connect with your spirit guides so that they can help you discover and live your purpose in order to create the change you want to see in the world. And someone who helped me on this path is here with us today. And I'm super excited to interview fellow Hay House author, Jessica Yui, who is the founder of the Purpose Academy, an online program for people ready to embrace their calling and share it with the world. In Britain, she is hailed as one of the most inspiring entrepreneurs by the Evening Standard and one of the most influential women by Glamour magazine. And her book, Purpose, Find Your Truth and Embrace Your Calling is her raw and honest life story and how she went from being a single teenage mother to a glittering career in public relations to a spiritual awakening that led her to a more authentic and fulfilling life in Jamaica. But most of all, she's an amazing human being and I'm honored to have her here with us today. Welcome, Jessica. Oh, thank you. What beautiful. <laughs> that was a beautiful. <laughs> Well, intro thank you <laughs> well that's who you are <laughs> I appreciate it. i take it <laughs> i allow it I, exactly. I it. <laughs> that's what we're talking about here right <laughs> we're talking about totally totally <laughs> so finding and living your purpose isn't something you can do in a day in fact, it takes a lifetime of listening to your soul and resisting the temptation to just do what everyone else does and instead taking action to forge your own path. Tell us a little bit about your background and your first steps on that path to finding and living your purpose. Um, it's been a, you know, it's been a continual practice of learning to trust myself I guess to trust my higher self to trust that inner wisdom um, that always knows um, what the next right thing is and um, for years gosh you know for years and years I didn't listen you know I was completely disconnected from feeling which I think is the portal to the listening um, or the sort of doorway to the listening. And, um, you know, I was numbed out and, and plastered over the fear, the, the unconscious fear of feeling through um, overachieving and workaholism, um, which were really my, the antidote for a long while, or the plaster to my shame, which was so heavy um, and thick, mine, that which didn't belong to me that was passed on. Um, and so I discovered pretty early on as, as so many of us do in society with, the, with, its, with its sort of prevalent, prevalent notion of what success is, that the more that I did and the more, my, the more um, that my output was impressive, um, the better I was received. <laughs> so I was like, oh, this works very early on, you know, having gone from, as you, said being that young teen mum um who was seen as a failure and a disappointment and largely sort of written off in the best possible way because of other people's limitate limiting beliefs um and you know they became mine and um and yeah I think because I had this ability to dream you know which which was a I think there's a thin line between dissociating and dreaming right <laughs> but for me <laughs> You know, I was very practiced at it. And so that was actually the thing that meant, even though my circumstances, you know, being on benefits, having a young baby, being 18, no qualifications, living in this tower block, even then it was the, the, it was the dreams which really kept me alive. You know, they gave me, um, they enabled me to see a possibility beyond my current circumstances um, and something inside me, something inside me, which I think was, was, was there very young, was perhaps always there, um, said that, that, that they were possible. 
they, they said they were possible. And so, yeah, you know, the, the, those years of um, dreaming, taking action, being defined by my career in, in media and the amazing people I work with and the places I traveled to, which changed my life, like practically transformed, opened up new possibilities, new ways of being. Um, you know, when all that all sort of came crashing down in 2016, um, when I got present to care for my dad through his terminal cancer diagnosis, that was really the, the breaking open and the beginning of, of feeling grief um, was, was the catalyst. And, you know, in being willing to finally feel the pain that was there, um, more and more life began to open up. And then I could no longer um, live by purely through um, the, the, the direction of my mind, because I'd had access to what becomes possible from that space of surrender and this magnificent, you know, um, alternate path that presented itself to me when I let go of the steering wheel of my life. So it's been a continued practice of, of learning to trust and making bigger, bigger, braver leaps um, toward more of myself and more life. And when you were younger and still you had these dreams, but, and you had that feeling that, yes, it's possible that these dreams become reality. Did you feel that as a sort of calling or a purpose, or would you have not used these words when you were younger? I wouldn't have used the words, but I always had a sense of, 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 of my position. That's the word that's coming up, interestingly enough. And, and I don't mean in any kind of hierarchical way, just of who I was, you know, very young or who I was here to be, <laughs> which, you know, through my teen years, I got completely disconnected from because then the, you know, the conditioning and the need to fit just comes in with such power doesn't it in your teen years but as a little person as a sort of seven eight year old you know I was always arranging productions and directing these performances and <laughs> you know I loved it I was this like little director <laughs> you know, who was very good at persuading headmasters and things to give me the space to express and and have others express mm. which is really what I do today and yeah so totally <laughs> Just today, it's not a production of Annie, you know, with yeah. a, a battery operated dog, but it was the, the feeling of aliveness and of pride and collaboration and expression was the same. And um, so, yeah, I think that was there. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting, like, because when we're in the moment, we don't see these things, but looking back, we see like, oh, it's been there all the time. How did I not see that? <laughs> And so was there like a moment in your life that you kind of like really thought, okay, that you would call it like a calling or a purpose? When did you start using these terms for it? It was, it was through, um, I think, you know, what occurred to me through um, that, that period caring for my dad of, of presence, you know, was, was transformational. And I, you know, on, on a number of different levels. It was this, um, I think for the first time in my life, I experienced true connection, you know, connection beyond, or was aware of myself witnessing it at least. And, you know, beyond the roles. And, and that was both with my father as he was transcending, you know, in, in being able to be with the pain of the grief, we moved and in him being able to, to be with his, you know, his, his um, transcendence, I guess, you know, we arrived, it became this sort of dance between two souls, you know, beyond father and daughter and, you know, the beauty of it. And I just had these profound experiences of connection with the carers who would sit, you know, in this bedside kind of, candlelight vigil you know when when near the end and a doctor who sat on my parents doorstep at four in the morning when we'd had to call for pain relief and 
just opened up about how he'd visit his mother's graveside every week and just talk to her. You know, his role as a doctor was parked, this idea that you don't overshare with your patients, you know. Right. Um, that all of those, all of those barriers to connection sort of fell away and all that was left was love. And I experienced my father's spirit leave his body as he was passing. And I mean, you just never, nothing is ever the same again. Suddenly this belief in there being more was exchanged for, for a, just a deep experiential knowing of, of who we are. And I've forgotten the question, but... <laughs> um, when was the moment you you started like calling it a, a, a calling or a, or a purpose? So then I was like, what on earth has happened? So dad is now past and I'm trying to make sense of what on earth is going on. Who, who, this discombobulation, this disarray that I know is so common um, when, we, when we can have these experiences. And there's a part of us which is resisting and wanting to hold on to all that we knew of who we were and how we, defined ourselves, and that that sort of I, I imagine it sort of clinging on to the edge of the swimming pool you know when the tide is sort of current is pulling you and so I then this appetite for understanding what had occurred for me consuming all the books and listening and trying to to really comprehend and then integrate um, I think the language emerged from there because it wasn't so some of it emerged from, from the, the wisdom and experience of others, but actually the word purpose, my, when we were going through the process of coming up with titles for the book, you know, as you know, Hey House, I'm making suggestions. And, um, and actually I was taken back to a conversation with my dad who, you know, had, a, had, a, had his own real kind of journey of, of self-actualization, I guess, on, on reflection and, lots of pain you know and lots of wisdom as a result mm -hmm. and he had an experience after coming to Britain as a black man in the, in the Windrush years um, right. a teacher whose qualifications weren't recognized and found himself doing odd jobs and then sort of got in with 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 he was a young man kind of 20 years old started getting into trouble um, and the, at that time Anyway, he ended up in, in prison for a while, um, like a short spell and um, something kind of financial to do, some kind of fraudulent thing. Mm -hmm. and he was in turmoil, in despair in this cell, um, not because he was imprisoned, but because he was like, what is life about? My dad was this mm. philosophical man and he was in pain and he'd been shipped away by parents and all of this abandonment he'd lost a child um despair yeah and he said suddenly the word purpose oh. came in this jail cell mm -hmm. and that was a real fork in the road for him and that was long before I was even born but I remembered that story and and it just that's how the title of the book came Came. Wow. So it was an ancestral gift in that sense. Yeah. That's really beautiful. Wow. So no wonder you always had that sense with you because your dad had that experience and it was like a really, I would probably call it a spiritual experience. And so it was deep in his soul and that came with you when you came into the world. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. And how, what would you say if someone says, I don't know what my calling is. I don't know what my purpose is. How do I find out? Do you have an answer for that? Yeah, I think you, you, you start this wonderful adventure of getting to know you. Because for me, it's, it's not really to do with, it's not at all to do with doing anything. It's, it's a, I believe our purpose is to be um, the most, the sort of truest expression of who we are the essence of ourself and allow that to be, to, to, to have life breathed into it. And um, from that space of alignment, we will, we really can't help be inspired to create things. And that might not be matter, that might not be a tangible thing. For some of us, it will. Um, 
and for others it might just be a way of being and 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 your purpose might be um much more to do with who you are for others in a completely non-business sense um but 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 from that space of of being um inspiration will flow and flood in in my experience and then we will know what to do but we'll do a number of different things and it's not yes. <laughs> our purpose right it's 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 the us it's the it's the usness our purpose is to be who we are here to be yeah yeah and also purpose is a journey not a destination <laughs> yeah yeah and there's always more which is was yeah. what's so is delicious about it yeah and challenging yeah. <laughs> But then even if like you think, okay, I, I have this purpose or I feel this calling, it always takes a lot of courage to like take that leap. Did you ever have like a moment that you had to take that leap or that you felt like, wow, this is a bit scary. <laughs> um, am I ready to do this? What moment was that in your life or were there several moments? Yeah, several over and over again. And I, I think it's a cycle. I think it's a you know the leap in the early leaps of of um going back to school after i'd had a baby and the shame of you know um you know having been kicked out of class for falling asleep and then going back this time with a baby and asking them to take me back because this time i'm pretty serious i'm here to learn you know um all of those moments which required me to step into the into a, a space of the unknown which was a doorway to um, my own expansion. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a beautiful, uh, uh, I've forgotten the name of the book, um, but there's a beautiful example, Tara, what's Tara Moore playing big? Mm, yeah. Mm -hmm. Tara Moore, and she talks about this, this, the Hebrew words for fear. There are two different words. And one, Hera, is um, this fear, which is, a feeling of being in the presence of the divine. It's like a fear of this expansion. Um, and it's a different kind of fear to this, the kind which is, 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 is sort of closed and has a, it has a smallness about it. This other kind of fear is like, is a really beautiful thing. It's, it's full of possibility. Um, if only we will, will find, you know, find that courage to step. And so it's continued, you know, even now, um, sometimes it's, 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 it's knowing that the next right thing is not the easy thing and not necessary. And there's a part of me that wants to kick and tantrum. I want, but I don't want to do this, but I know I have to. <laughs> I know the feeling. <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> and you know, you're on this journey and you're like, you have no choice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> not do the next right thing is like, and sometimes you do cave, you know, so that's okay too. And it's like, they're not making yourself wrong and, so it's a, it never goes away. I think we just get to witness it and see it for what it is and then choose anyway. Yeah. Um, and you also just mentioned um, that part of it that's, yeah, that's a big part of it of not wanting to take the leap is shame oftentimes. Um, and really to this like um, fear to be seen because we are ashamed of who we are. Um, how do you like, do you have a process to overcome that? Or do you have something that you tell yourself to overcome that? How, how did you find your voice and express your voice in that sense? I think it's a continual, a continual piece of work, but it's, it's for me, it's, it's all in the staying closely. It's, it's in the, 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 the it's in the awareness. And for me, anything that brings me into regular connection with myself, whether it's the movement and really being in my body through yoga or meditation, um, but journaling, journaling for me is, is just so non-negotiable um, as the first thing I do every morning and, and increasingly in the evening as well. So that that connection to myself and that the, the ability to not become my thoughts and witness them um, and then kind of just sort of, um, you know, direction check myself, where is this coming from? And, um, and to acknowledge myself, you know, to forgive myself, all of this is a part of my journaling process now, 
so that any feelings of shame I'm able to notice and I'm able to release them and I think that is just is 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 just so huge in not becoming the feeling you know it's okay that they they come up but we don't have to allow them to um to swamp us yeah Yeah. define us I guess yeah yeah, I just started um, doing something at night. I asked myself the question, which one or two thoughts held me back the most today? And I journal about that. And I really love it because it kind of like shines a light on yeah on these thoughts that are about shame or, or not wanting to be seen and all these things that are really self-destructive in the end. And then you see it more the next day, once you catch it, you see it more the next day or the next week, and then it kind of dissolves and it's amazing. (laughs) Uh, And isn't life generous in just, as you say, giving you all these examples (laughs) of where it is. Oh, suddenly it's everywhere. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) And then your work or, um, yeah, your work has a lot to do also with um, visibility. So you've had like this glittering career in public relations, working with super famous people like Samuel Jackson and the Duchess of Sussex, Sussex, Meghan Markle. Um, How did you learn to do that? Was that something that you always did? You already said an example, actually, like when you were younger, you already were able to convince the headmaster to let you do this play and things like this. But where did you like to, um, where did you get the courage to do that? Uh, I, I, you know what, it's so interesting because public relations is the sort of the art of um, controlling perceptions. And, you know, often it's about making over what is, so it's more glittery and more shiny and suppressing the parts that might not be palatable to the audience. (laughs) So I think having grown up as a child who, whose own feelings of, you know, the kind of trauma that we grew up with as kids, um, my feelings were so suppressed. My sense of self was so, um, you know, locked away. Um, and I was so good at dissociating and dreaming and, you know, that, so that I, I had a great skill set to work with. <laughs> particular industry and and you know a gift for you know all of the beauty that comes with sadness I think and pain of empathy and uh, knowing how life-changing it is to feel seen and so somewhere within that mix of all those things um, it just made me very good at my job and um, And I think as I became more confident in who I was and what my values were through my kind of late 20s, I began to challenge the way that things were done as a sort of industry standard and question and bring in my own sense of of, of, of rightness, of, of, of love. I wouldn't have called it that then, but that became, and people of course felt that. Yeah. And so, you know, even then um, I was different in my approach and um, people felt that and and appreciated it. And so, you know, energetically that um, helped me to do well. So, yeah. So your journey of like becoming more authentic really made you really good at your job in the end. A hundred percent. And it's funny, this idea about visibility, you know, even my own journey with it has, you know, it, it, it continues. When I, when I first started the Purpose Academy, it was called the Transformational Visibility Academy. And I had to change the name for all sorts of reasons because I realized it was no longer truly representative of what I was really offering. And that the visibility was actually less to do with how we are seen to others and much more to do with how we come coming to truly see ourselves you know because when we really see who see ourselves it's like lights camera action in the best possible way and I needed to bring the focus back to that and then have the external visibility be 
a byproduct and something that we look at later rather than the kind of um, the crux of it. Yeah, that makes very much sense. <laughs> so, um, and you wrote a book called Purpose and um, the new updated edition has been out. Um, and tell us a little bit about the book. You're in it. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, <laughs> thank you so much for that. <laughs> yeah, you had to be in it. That just profound moment. I won't ruin it for anybody that's listening or watching, but um, yeah, this profound. So the book, I mean, I think that it, the new edition has five brand new chapters and they start where the initial, where the first edition leaves off, but it's really about my, my call to move to Jamaica with my son, which was kind of, you know, mid pandemic or early pandemic, um, I just felt this call and had to listen. Um, but prior to that, you know, this, and then everything that, that sort of unfolded through, through the move, um, the continuation of my journey and the insights and, but prior to me knowing I was moving, I, you know, we had this magical, reading which I remember I was sitting in the car park of my yes. gym <laughs> in you know so I think it was like a sort of autumnal day in um Rains Park Surrey you know <laughs> and I think the charger wasn't really working and it was a little bit but we had this reading and you know you basically told me I was going to have this huge lifestyle change and I had no idea what that meant And, and, and gave me some direction, which I then took, which of course, the next right thing, the next right thing, and before you know it. So um, I guess, yeah, the book is really a, a response to the question you asked me at the start, which is around um, when we allow the magic to unfold and we, we stop gripping at life and wanting to control it as, you know, purpose is able to come our purpose is able to come through us yeah and so it's the story of that the continued story of that which you know and it's um, a it's a beautiful yeah, book yeah. so everyone definitely go get it it's very inspirational and also how did like writing the book how did that change your work I know like you had like the PR agency and then you started feeling like you wanted to do something else and your dad passed away Did the book, like the writing process itself, have an influence on how you how your work changed? Yeah, massively. I mean, it's night and day. It's um, it's like my life before purpose, the book, and and after it changed everything. Um, and it wasn't the book as a tangible output that changed everything. It was, you know, as you said, it was the the the, the leaning in the courage to be with the transformation that was occurring to me and um, yeah, to let go of who I was in order for who I was becoming to occur. And the writing, I mean, it's just the most profound process to allow yourself to revisit your experiences. And, and there's this reclamation that I feel occurs around our stories um, and then and there's the recognition of my goodness you know as I shared with the sort of PR experience you know why I was good at PR and, and you start to recognize you to really have evidence for how everything that's ever happened to us has yeah positioned us perfectly for who we're here to be today and you know we move differently when we really embody that we just do and that inspired me to want to share that with others and that's where the bigger than a book course came from which you know is my three-month program helping people to write their own story but it's all from that place now whereas life before purpose was the head was in charge and now it's my heart rules and my head is my head works for my heart <laughs> yeah exactly the brain is like a computer it shouldn't ro yeah. rule us it should help us <laughs> Yes, <laughs> that's amazing. And I try and give it holiday. I try and give it time off and stuff. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, well, 
that was really amazing. Thank you so much for sharing. Last question, where can people find you and get in touch with you and where can they buy the book? Uh, I, the book on all the all the places, I guess, you know, Amazon, Waterstones and all of that stuff, um, all of those outlets. Um, and then where can they get into my Instagram is probably where I'm most active social media wise. And that's Jessica underscore Huey, H-U-I-E underscore. Um, okay, awesome. Yeah. Well, thank, thank you so much. It's been really lovely. Thank you for taking the time. I appreciate you. Much love. Thank you, honey.